Um, I'm grateful that you all are here today. We're going to continue this series, The Good Life. We are in the back side of it as we get ready to head into Easter season. You guys have enjoyed this series, right? Good deal. Um, we've been walking through awareness and kind of seeing the things that are some of our dysfunctions and being able to approach them and recognize them. Um, I would love to say that today is the day that we get to dive into the good life and it's an easy conversation. It's going to feel good when you leave, but that's not the case. Um, I know what did feel good last night, though, was some of you about one minute left in the game. You were like, dear Jesus, if we win this ball game, I will be at church tomorrow. And then you woke up and you were like, all right, I got to go to church. I got to keep my end of the promise. Woo pig. So the NCAA tournament is one of my favorite parts of the year. But no matter what got you here, I'm excited that you are here and God's got something in store for you as we dive into the word today. We are people that we're beginning to recognize that we have dysfunctions, right? That we have some insecurities. We have some flaws that God did not intend for us to have. And that changes things around us. Some of you have been maybe walking through them, and I want us to continue to do that. Um, but some of your dysfunctions, how many of you have a dysfunction that is road rage? Like when you get into a different atmosphere, you just become a different person. You're like, I am not putting a real life sticker on the back of my car because of the road rage that I have. That is the reason I do not want to endorse the church. How many of you, there's not going to be any hands that go up already, know, love to move. Like you love to sell your house, pack it up, and move to the next one. No. It just does something in how you think, in how you act, that just really turns us into a different person. One of the things that's amusing to me about moving, I learned this my junior year, or my freshman year, getting ready to go to college, is people love when you move in and when you show up, but they're not very crazy about you when you leave. Like everyone wants to help you move into a home, but when it's time to actually roll out, they're like, oh yeah, I'm busy. College, it's like, we're gonna help all these freshmen move in, but we know the sophomores and juniors and seniors, like they've already paid their money. They're just gonna show up and they can do all the work themselves. One of my dysfunctions that I learned yesterday, um, I, I like change, like I, I just like change. Um, I don't wanna change things just to change things if there's no point in changing it. Um, but if there's gonna be a positive effect for it, then let's change it. Let's see, what's, let's see what we can do there. Um, but I love to play golf. So it's something I've loved to do since I was three years old and I could walk. My family's done it. But I found something yesterday that really messed with my head on the golf course. And when I was getting ready for this message today, I was like, God, what is this opening illustration going to be like? What is this dysfunction that you want me to talk about? And God in his providence and in all that he does, um, he set it up for me on the golf course. And I was like, well, I'm glad I got to play golf today. So I played with a friend in a tournament up in Branson, and it was a two-man best ball, so which means you just take the best score out of you two, and you, um, whatever the total is for the day, you, you land on. Um, but it was a little bit different, and it was called the leprechaun, or the luck of the Irish kind of open. So every green did not have a flag. There was no pin on the green. So you just knew to hit the green. But every hole, every green had three holes on it. So what's the luck of the Irish is you just hit the green and then you can pick whichever hole you want to go to. Which in my mind, I was like, well, this should just make it easier because I'm going to hit the green and then whichever one's closest, that's the one I'm going to go to. That is not how they did it. Like we were on the 18th hole and it was a long par five and we kind of realized that they're not doing things the way that they should be doing them or the way that I thought they should be doing them by just putting them all around the green to make it easier. No, they were strategic in where they placed them. So the 18th hole, I was like, they probably put all three of these on the back side of the green because it's a par five and they want me to try and go for it. They want me to try and clear the water. They want me to risk it so I could get back there. But the safe play is the play towards the middle of the green. So I was like, oh my God, I'm going to go safe. But I know, I just know that they're going to be back there. But maybe I'll get lucky and they'll have them split. Well, we get up to the green, and my ball's in the middle of the green, and guess where all the holes are? They are at the back of the green, about 60 feet away, all placed together in a cluster, making one big hole. It's like, man, if I would have just done what my gut was telling me, then I would have been okay. But this created like this dysfunction. Like, I know how to play golf, but now I have to think about how I play differently. And so we walk through this idea of dysfunction today. We're going to unpack and we're going to do some layers. Actually, this happened um, even this morning. Like, I've got accustomed to teaching and preaching from my iPad. Well, you know what happened this morning? Oh. <laughs> so, not using that today. 
So I'm having to go back to my computer. But we got dysfunctions. We got things to address. Some of you have been walking through stuff in, in the last few years even, and you've had a, been having a discussion with your spouse. And the question comes up like, why are you the way that you are? And your response is, because you make me this way. That's why I am the way I am. And there's, there's some truth to that. There's a reality to we respond and we react in certain ways because of certain things that have happened or are happening. These are things that transpire in our subconscious. We are unaware of the things that are around us, so we purely react rather than process and respond. It just becomes our fleshly nature. That's why we're going to get into there's a war between the spirit and the flesh. The flesh does what the flesh wants to do, but the spirit wants to do something different. And there becomes this disconnect in my spirit and what I want to do and what I should do is different than what I actually do. It's because in our subconscious, we just merely do what we've done our whole life. We're born into a broken, distorted, dysfunctional world. And the way that we grow up creates patterns and rhythms that wire our brain to do things in a certain way. And they're not usually healthy. And we are unaware of these things. So how can we begin to think with the mind of Christ who died on the cross for our sins? So if he died to forgive us, why would he not die for us to think different also? So we're going to get into what Paul says a little bit today in, in Galatians chapter 5. And then we got some other texts as well. But first one in Galatians chapter 5. I've got an Easter invite in my Bible. That's cool. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So the verses on the screen are going to be a little bit different because they're going to be NIV and I'm reading ESV. But in this, we are already looking at the war that's taking place between our flesh and between our spirit, between our flesh and between our, our mind. Our, the way that we act doesn't look like the way that we know that we should. Why does that happen? But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. You did not think you were going to hear the word orgies at church today, did you? I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against things there is no such law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you want to tell me that the word of God is not relevant today, lean into that list right now and tell me those are not things that culture are shoving down our throats everywhere we turn. Now we, we, we look at it and we say, okay, yeah, I, I know the orgies thing is weird and I know sexual, uh, sexual immorality and, and I understand impurities and sensuality and idolatry and sorcery. Like these things, yes, obviously they're wrong, drunkenness. But look at the ones that we just automatically dismiss because they actually hit home to us so, so significantly. Fits of anger. I've got a four-year-old in our house right now. Kaylee and I are trying our best to raise godly children. And there are sometimes that fits of anger from a four-year-old. You're just like, what is happening to you right now? And so we're walking through this and I'm like, man, there are so many times though that the littlest things can create a dysfunction in the way I react. And as a 30-year-old man, I begin to throw a fit of anger that looks like a four-year-old. Envy, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. One of the ones that the enemy uses so strongly in the church are divisions, where we are supposed to be in a unity 
together. But if we can get to talking about one another, then we're going to create a division where rather than being on mission, we're trying to do our own thing, our own way, and we can't get anything accomplished to further the gospel because we're all divided and can't come on agreement. Things that are so, so all these things, rather than looking at the fruit of the spirit and the things that reflect the heart and the nature of God. Because those things that are flesh have become what we do in our subconscious and they're just who we are and what we do because we're not aware of the things that are around us. You see, God is all powerful, all knowing and all present. That's what makes him God. But Satan is none of those things. He is not omnipresent. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipotent. Which means he has to work even harder because he has to submit to God. He has to have people. He has to have demons. He has to have things that are looking at because he cannot be everywhere. He has to work harder. But even though he's supposed to be the one that works harder, we let the door open and it makes it even easier for him than it should be because we walk in our subconscious rather than recognizing that Jesus wants to transform our mind as much as we want him to transform our heart, but we don't let him. The scripture says that Jesus waits for us to open the door of our heart so that he may come in. Why would he just barge into our minds if he's gonna wait on us to transform our lives? He wants to walk with us through the healing process, but we just want to take the easy route and say, I know my eternity is transformed and changed, but I don't want to go through the gritty and the hard right now for my circumstances now to be changed. Because I know I'm going to have to face some stuff that's going to be difficult. We, we think it's cute to say, I'm, I'm a, I just don't like confrontation. If I bring it up, then it's just going to rock the boat and everybody's going to be upset. I'm not saying be a jerk, but you cannot change what you will not confront. You cannot change what you will not confront. Whether it's a decision you've made that now has an outcome that you're responsible for, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a circumstance, whether it's a trauma, whether it's an abuse, you cannot change what you will not confront. We get to these moments in life where the world and culture says cause and effect. Anything that has a cause, it will have an effect. Scripture refers to it as reaping and sowing. And we're gonna walk through three of those this morning. Actually, it's 12.06 now. So this afternoon, we're gonna walk through three of these. What you reap, you will sow. So three of these, when you get to a moment in life, you know you have decisions to make. But there are also moments in life that happen every single day that we make decisions that we don't even recognize they're decisions that we make because they happen in our subconscious. They're not even something we think about. They're not something that we reflect on. They're, they are just and innate in us because of the way we have lived life for the last 30, 40, 50, 60, 16 years, whatever it might be. And we let these actions begin to define who we are rather than recognizing how we are actually defined and what Jesus has for us. So when we get to these crossroads where we're going through life, three things in the way that we reap and that we sow. And the first is this, is we reap what we sow. This one's pretty basic, pretty generic. Yeah, I get it. If I'm gonna plant an orange tree, then I expect an orange. If I'm gonna set out on a destination and I put it in Google Maps, then I expect to get to that destination. Some of you are like, no, it never works like that. There's always road construction where we detour. You reap what you sow. It says this in Galatians chapter six. Do not be deceived for God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, from the flesh he will reap destruction, corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. The reason we live in so much dysfunction is because we have lived in the flesh for so long that we continue to just live in dysfunction. 
because we don't even recognize what the spirit has for us because dysfunction is just what the world is and who we are. But that leads to destruction and corruption and everything that has a cause has an effect. Whatever you reap, you will sow. Your, your relationships, your friendships, your actions, your addictions, all these things are things that are gonna have an effect on down the line or even in the moment that we just do in our subconscious because we don't think differently than the way we were created to think. We think with the, with the way the world has taught us to. It hasn't even taught us, it's just happened. So we live life and we're not aware of our surroundings. We're not aware of what we engage in. We're not aware of what we do. We're not aware of the traps. We're not aware of the prisons that Satan is setting for us all around us. And we walk right into them because we don't set the standards. We don't set the expectation. And we do all the work for him because we continue to live by the flesh rather than walking in the spirit. We reap what we sow. We also will reap more than we sow. We'll reap more than we sow. Tell me, what is this right here in my hand? It's an apple. Anybody disagree with that? No, it's an apple. But this is all how you see things. So yes, this is one apple. But if I cut this apple open and I take seeds out and I plant them in the ground, one apple now becomes hundreds of apples because then that seed becomes a tree and on that tree becomes more apples. So I have planted, I have reaped an apple. I've sowed an apple, but what I will reap are more apples and more apples and more apples. See, if you would be available and recognize what God's doing in your life, be open to opportunities and obedience, then what kind of significant impact would you have recognizing and knowing that God is setting up intentional encounters for intimate conversations that are gonna yield eternal results? This is why we are so passionate at Real Life Church about the value that we are better together. Because there are people in your workplaces, there are family members, there are friends that you are gonna connect with every single day, every single week that I will never ever come across. And I wanna celebrate with you those life changes that take place, but God has set them in your atmosphere, in your circle for a specific reason. But are you going to be obedient to the fact that you are one apple that can reap a greater harvest if you do the work and plant if you cut open a little bit and recognize that there's more in there that we can reap when we sow. God is incredible in how he knits things together. Can you imagine, can you imagine as we get into the third one that we reap later than we sow? Can you imagine that you quit on your marriage? You, can, you always work for your marriage. If you want your marriage to be successful, you will work for it. Let's take it a step forward. Your kids. Some of us have quit on a marriage, but we're, we're not going to quit on our kids, or I would hope not. But can you imagine if through this process, like your, your kid got to kindergarten, and you would expect from those five years of your investment in your parenting that now they're going to be a citizen in the community that's going to be of high standard and high regards, that they're going to make an impact, that they're going to show up to church every single week, that they're going to provide for themselves, that they're going to be able to fend for themselves at five years old because you expected the five years of your investment to yield a result right then. No. You walk the process out and being a parent consistently every single day not even once they walk out the door, you're still a parent that's available to them and you want to walk with them. It may look a little bit different where you sit, but you still want to encourage. And you, so we reap later than we sow. There's a, a plant that's called a Chinese bamboo tree. And they're a really cool plant. Like if you go to the zoo, you're going to see a lot of them and stuff. And You'll see them, in, in, of course, in China because of the Chinese bamboo tree. If you go to China, you're going to see them. But people try and plant these often. 
because they look cool. They can become like a privacy fence and stuff like that. But I want you to look at these, these bamboo trees. So in this forest, look at how large these trees are. Actually, you can see here, these are the trees. This is the person that's walking on the bridge. That's their head. Look, look at these things. If you were to plant a Chinese bamboo tree, how many of you like to plant things? How many of you are like, I'm going to do succulents or I'm going to do plastics because then I don't have to take care of them? A Chinese bamboo tree, you plant it, you water it, you take care of the soil. Six months down the line, most of us are going to expect to see something. Not a leaf, not a branch, there's nothing. A year in, nothing. Two years, still watering, still making sure the soil is good, still making sure it's in the right place in the house. Three years in, nothing. How many of you are like, I'm quitting after three months, much less three years, and I'm not seeing a result here? Four years, nothing. Five years, nothing. After six years, within a six-week stretch, the Chinese bamboo tree can grow up to 90 feet tall. But you know how tall it grows if you quit after year one, after year two, after year three, after year four, after year five? Nothing. How many people walk through life thinking that they're doing, they're trying, and they quit because they just think it's dead rather than sticking out the process to when they can actually see the result and the blessing on the other side? See, we don't hold the timeline at all of when God's going to do what God promises to do. We just have to be available and be obedient to it. There's a difference in trying something and training for something. How many of you right now, if I was like, hey, it's spring break this week, so on Wednesday, we're going to have a spring break marathon here at Real Life Church, and we want every single one of you to run it with us. Now you're like, I am finding a different church right now. Because most of us know that we're not going to be able to run a marathon tomorrow or Wednesday, because you have to train for it. Some of us might try to run it, but we're really not expecting to be able to finish it. See, a lot of people try to get healed. They try to have their mind changed. They try, but when they're not seeing the results they really expect or it doesn't fit their timeline, then uh, at least I tried it rather than training for it. A lot of people, you, you may know some of them, or maybe that's you right now in this season. You're like, I have tried church because people have told me time and time again that if I just go to church and I try that, then something different will take place in my life. And I'm not seeing it, but I tried it. No, no, no. You tried an experience and you tried an atmosphere, but you did not train to follow Jesus who holds the power and authority to actually change your life. So are we going to try or are we going to train? Because we may not see what we reap, from what we sowed until later on down the line. Are we gonna be able to be okay with that? When we, when we look at this, you go back to we reap more than we sow, and we'll get into this section here in a minute. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. It's Matthew 13, eight. We reap what we sow, we reap more than we sow, and we reap later than we sow. The only thing that we're in control of in all of that is we reap what we sow. The other two we trust God for. Because when we reap what we sow, it's everything that we put into us. It's the things that we take in because whatever you put in is what's gonna come out. You're around people that are continually putting you in poor situations, you're like, I just cuss because we cuss. No, you cuss because you're around people that cuss and you think it's normal. You're depressed because you're not either around people or you're around the wrong kind of people. You're overwhelmed because you're not handling these things the correct way and everybody's throwing everything on you. They don't know anything different. So let's look at this in a way that's actually honestly pretty rough. When we are born into this world, 
we have born and we have not yet sinned, okay? We have not been able to. As a baby, you will not sin, but it's going to happen because of the world and the nature that we live in. So in these moments, sometimes, yes, born with predispositions where the way you're going to think is going to be difficult, but predispositions are not an excuse to live that way. Whether it be an addiction mentality, whether it be a tendency and your attraction, whatever, those things are not an excuse. So when we look at this, we have a blank slate. We have a blank canvas. And so if I'm going to tell a story, and please, if you're in the room today, please know I'm not telling your story specifically, even if it may look like your story. This is not about anybody that's specifically here. So let's say this, this young child knows that his parents are protecting him, feels like he's in a safe environment. Parents always provide for them. A great school, great community, always at church. Everybody's doing what they can to make sure they set them on the path for success. But a few years, six, seven years old, something happens and a family friend sexually abuses the young man. Now, what was a clean slate now has some traumas to address. And if this is not handled properly, it is going to yield dysfunctional thoughts and dysfunctional mindsets and dysfunctional minds, uh, actions for years and years and years to come. Now, that action, what was done to this young man is disgusting. It should never happen, but we live in a fallen, broken world. And so that's what does happen. Our nasty, ugly, broken things. But now in the thought process, once it goes into the function junction, that input that is now there, how they process it, how he processes it will determine the subconscious decisions that take place in the years to follow. So because this catastrophic traumatic event has now taken place, don't trust my parents. We don't trust that there's a safe environment. This young man now is looking over his shoulder anytime a friend comes to the house. They look at things differently in the community. Their thought process is totally changed. And then we get into teenage years. So 13, 14, 15, developing relationships, trying to navigate what junior high and high school looks like. But because this past trauma has not been addressed or healed from, now relationships and value come from improper places. So something physical has already been taken from me, so now I'm just gonna give it to any other girl that's in the room. And not only am I not gonna value myself, but this young man's thinking, I'm not gonna value the others that are around me. This young man is insecure. This young man is, is now navigating things in an unhealthy way, probably addicted to pornography before the even 13, 14, 15. Hiding, cowering, because what was a traumatic event was not addressed in a healthy way. And so you compound a traumatic event with dysfunctional thought process that yields dysfunctional actions. And then we get on down the line when we get to adulthood and we see an image that kind of should look like the shape of a person, but is nothing at all what God intended. So you, your past does not define you but it's definitely going to shape you. But how are you gonna use these moments to heal from them to be able to become tools to connect and equip people so that you as one apple, as you as one Christian, will see a multiplication begin to take place. You say, well, I'm a victim. Shame does such a crazy thing. Is it takes what took place from the attacker, from the abuser, from the addicted, 
and places that shame on the victim as if it was their fault. And now they begin to define themselves in this way. Can I set some of you free in this moment is you are not defined by your past, but you have a future because Jesus has something in store for you, but you have to be available to walking through the healing process. So yes, your eternity has been forgiven and been changed, but you have to let him begin to change your mind in the way that you think. That's a choice that you have to make. See, scripture says that, that you are not defined by those things. You are changed in a way. God is so beautiful in the imagery and the fact that he is the only one that can change your label and change your name. No matter what society or the culture or the friends around you say who you are, they have no authority to speak those things in your life unless you let them. Only God can change those things in a way that are actually significant and supernatural. He, he did it with Saul to Paul. He did it with Peter when he said, Simon Peter, you will be now known as Peter. And upon you, I will build my church. I know you have dysfunctions. I know you doubt, I know you dismiss, I know you deny, but if we can get past the dysfunctions, let me show you the great things that you can do and I will build my church upon you. But we instead, we sit in insecurity and we let our past define us rather than letting Jesus change our future. It doesn't have to be an abuse thing. It may be something as what seems so simple as my parents had a lot of money growing up and now I put this thing in my head that I have, to, in order to be successful, I have to be wealthy and I have to have money. And the pressure is placed with on, on you that you make different decisions that are dysfunctional because you have not processed things in a healthy way. You know what's difficult about this? Is that it all becomes reaction. It all becomes reaction rather than actually being a response and we just take a step or we run or we do and we don't actually spend time with God. See, we won't sit in the stillness and calmness of who God is because there's moments that we know that he's gonna show us some really ugly things to walk through. And so that's why we don't wanna sit still sometimes. As we know we're gonna have to face our stuff. Jesus is amazing in the fact that whatever you uncover, he will cover it. But whatever you keep covered at some point, he's just and he's going to uncover it and expose it. And it's a whole lot more gracious when you come to the feet of Jesus and you expose it and you get accountability and you begin to heal rather than being embarrassed because he's a just God and he comes to the light. It's God's job to forgive and to transform. It's our job to do the hard part and transform how we think. It's amazing how God created us as human beings. If you look at what Paul says in the being transformed in the renewing of your mind, this is before scientists dove into the wiring of our brains. This is before the concept of cognitive thinking has been developed. But yet he says, be transformed in the renewing of your mind, knowing in this moment that you can change the way that you think through the power of the Holy Spirit. It says this in 1 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly or foreign to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It's incredible how Paul flips this. For in the beginning, I don't understand what the Spirit is saying. This discernment, this process, like as I'm walking through it, because we're not in the Spirit, so how will we understand what the Spirit is saying if we're merely walking in the flesh? But we get to the end and it says, who has known for the Lord so as we're instructed? But we have the mind of Christ. So if we have the mind of Christ, why do we continue to operate in the flesh? It's because we have to make cognitive, conscious decisions to do something different so that we can now think with the mind of Christ. And it's not gonna be easy. It says this in Matthew 13, three through seven, back to reaping and back to sowing. 
And he told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed some seeds, they fell along the path and the birds came up and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun arose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and they choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30 times. Let's look at these images again. When we go back to what this looks like and trying to plant seed on soil that culture has scorched and dried up to where it can't even take root or where the thorns or where it's scorched by the sun rather than getting to a place where we can truly hear the deposits and what God has for us. Half of learning this is unlearning that dysfunction. It's unlearning those subconscious decisions. Proper healing follows with proper direction and proper steps. So we've seen people in life that this is what was intended and we know they've had a traumatic experience, but they, they look different than the one at the end. They didn't have all the garbage and all the junk. It's because once the input came in, how it was processed yielded a different result. So some of us have a whole lot of unlearning to do so that we can properly think and properly see what God intended. That's the good life. It's to see with the mind of Christ. So how do we respond? You take a step. Nothing is gonna change by merely being aware of the situation. What action steps are we gonna take place to actually heal and be restored in our situation? Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, it's sow a thought and reap an action. Sow an act and reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. To do something differently than I did the day before means I have to think differently than I did yesterday. To be aware of that. I did something intentionally all throughout this message. It's because it's something that we do every single day. And that's this. In this room, if you fully believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, would you put your hand up for me real quick? Going up, going up. Thank you. I'm glad we're on the same page. But not only did he die on the cross for your sins, but on the cross, he bore your shame. He bore your shame. So that traumatic experience that you've walked through, that you've had, you don't have to carry that unless you choose to. Because he said, just as much as I want to change your eternity, I want to change the way that you think. Because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a child of God. You are a royal priesthood. You are precious in his sight. You are made in his image. But we want to hold on to that shame and we want to hold on to that guilt because we think it is ours. Lay it at the feet of Jesus so that you can be transformed completely and wholly. It will change the way you act emotionally and the way you respond. You cannot be spiritually mature, but be emotionally immature. It does not work that way. To be spiritually mature, you have to be emotionally mature. Because in your emotions, the way you respond, you cannot tell me that somebody that's walking in anger, you cannot tell me that somebody that is being unkind and deceitful, 
You cannot tell me someone that's being disrespectful. You cannot tell me or someone that is spiritually mature because those are not things that are fruit of the spirit. So if you're gonna be spiritually mature, you have to be emotionally mature. And that means walking through garbage so you can peel it back to get back to the blank slate so God can actually create you and show you what you were intended to be. He died on the cross from your sins, but he bore your shame so that you may have life and have life more abundantly. That's the good life. So why do we only let God do half the job? It's because the other part of it is the work that we have to do. And we don't want to do it. To experience freedom in Christ, you have to address what you have reaped because of what you have previously sown. And you're going to reap more than what you sow. You make poor decisions, you have poor life choices. It's not just gonna affect you, but it's gonna affect your kids, it's gonna affect your family, it's gonna affect your friends. But you know what? When you begin to walk a process of healing and restoration, not only does it affect you, but it affects your kids and it affects your family and it affects your friends. We reap what we sow. We reap more than what we sow and we reap later than what we sow.